everyone. So good to see everyone coming on, joining us for today's conversation here at NASCA. As you're coming in, please make sure you take a moment, rename yourself, give us your name and your state or your company that you're with. So great to see who is coming in from around the country. And again, we're so thrilled to have you with us for today's conversation. Got a great lineup of speakers, topics, and we're so excited to share a sneak peek of the findings of our most recent state collaborative. And we'll give everyone just another second or so to get connected to audio and we'll get started. Again, if you have any um, things you'd like to drop in our chat box, please drop any questions. If you'd like to connect with other colleagues on the call today, drop your LinkedIn information and we'd be glad to connect. Let us know again where you're dialing in from I'm Pam Goins, the Executive Director here at NASCA, the National Association of State Chief Administrators. If you happen to be new to NASCA or our monthly events, um, we do these activities to bring collective thought leadership, to share best practices, to learn and grow from each other. And we're very excited today to highlight the results of our state collaborative on cost optimization and efficiency. And you're gonna hear a little sneak peek today of the findings of a full report that will be coming out later this month. We've got some states that will respond to activities happening in their states as well. So it's gonna be a great opportunity to dive in and talk a lot about what's happening in the states as we're all working for increased success in state government operations with great outcomes for our citizens and our constituents. Let me introduce our panel today and then we'll get right into today's conversation. We have Casey o Osterkamp, who is Personnel Director from the Office of Administration in the state of Missouri. Gary Renslow, who is the Chief Information Officer at the Department of General Services in the state of California. And then we have two of our partners from KPMG, both Jeff Plant, who is the partner, and also Yash Akaria from the Managing Director, also from KPMG. And again, here at NASCA, we are so excited to really highlight and showcase the work that's been going on over the past several months with KPMG as a partner to look at these different efficiencies happening across state government. So we're excited today again to bring these initial results to you, a full report coming along in the next couple of weeks. And again, the ability for us to showcase what's happening in some of our states, and you're gonna hear from a couple of those states today. But first, let me introduce um, Jeff Plant, who's gonna kick us off, give us an overview of where we've been and then where we're headed with this report. So Jeff, I'll turn it over to you. Excellent, Pam, and everybody can hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. So thank you very much, Pam. Uh, KPMZ has uh, really enjoyed uh, the journey to where we are now. Uh, it was so great seeing a lot of uh, people in Rochester back in the fall and then getting to this point. So, so thank you very much. And we appreciate all the people uh, from the organization who participated in the project. Uh, and we're, like I said, we're almost done. Uh, hopefully we can uh, issue the report very soon. Um, but where this started, this started with just an idea. Where do we go working with the team to then doing a series of workshops, uh, more work in Rochester, then, then some additional work, and then to, to the point where we have a report. Um, but, but where it started. So we developed actual recommendations to address the top 10 priorities of state chief administrators uh, for the survey that was done. Uh, we had 25 chief administrators and their deputies uh, across 12 states uh, help uh, or participate in over four working sessions, uh, as well as some follow-ups back and forth. And we looked at common challenges and it was interesting, right? There were the challenges you always had and then how did uh, COVID and the challenges with COVID in some case, less than some, but more importantly, uh, what we saw is really sped up uh, the need to address some of the challenges and then how different challenges emerge that Yasha uh, will be talking to. But they're really prioritizing spending, cost control and savings, and, and really trying to get to, to a more modern agenda. Uh, the other thing is, you know, we, we prioritized five, five key areas. Uh, during the project, which Yash is going to go into deep dives and some of our case studies we'll talk about. The first, uh, just going to the next slide, is you know, how do you build a modern workforce, right? You know, we see it in the private sector, but it was interesting to see that you're all seeing it as well as how you build a modern workforce 
today's worker, today's uh, co uh, college graduates, they want a different experience than many of us uh, wanted when we got out of school or started our careers. It's much more virtual, much more device driven, working on devices, uh, less human action, interaction in some cases. So very interesting, uh, some of the things we saw uh, on building a modern workforce and, and the challenges of how you have to change both your human resources, your technology and uh, your, your space and how that's gonna work. Accelerating digitization, right? How many, how many people never heard of Teams two years ago or hardly use Zoom and then it became a you know, big part of your life uh, as you know, many of us can attest, you know, we're on 10 of these a day. Uh, enable more operating efficient operating models, right? You can't rely on paper anymore. You can't rely on as much going to people's desks. So, so how do you get more efficient? And how do you do that? Then enhancing trust. And, and when we say enhancing trust, it's all about security, right? So much more is being done electronically. You have to secure that data. You have to secure those transmissions. Uh, and with everything going on in the world, you're just staying one, one step ahead. So a lot of thought and a lot of investment into how you build trusted environments. And then again, the last piece was extracting greater value from state assets, right? Many of our states have a lot of assets, whether it's natural, whether it's uh, physical assets, you know, the data you own, and how can states start thinking about those assets differently and getting more uh, value from those assets? So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Yasha Chara, who is gonna dive into these areas more deeply. And uh, again, I just can't thank Pam and her team, as well as all the participants enough uh, for assisting us with this. So with that, I'll turn it over to Yash. Thanks, Jeff. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Yes. Awesome. Um, and this, and I just wanna kick it off by reiterating um, Jeff, what Jeff and um, Pam indicated. This has been a, a, a long and very detailed exercise to collaborate with the, you know, 12 different states and um, identifying the challenges, especially as the states were, you know, going through supporting this pandemic, supporting the operations. And so we really wanted to thank the states to go through this exercise with us and uh, support us and support NASCA as a collaborative piece to bring out the, you know, the strategies as to what uh, the states are using. And, and honestly, whatever you'll see in the way, the collaborative piece that is gonna come out and what we're gonna talk today is all around bringing the leading practice, bringing the challenges together, bringing the leading practices that the states are using today. And from a KPMG standpoint, what we are seeing in the market. So it's, it's, a, it's a collective piece of all these things coming together and helping you and uh, the industry today to move forward as a collective organization. Um, as Jeff talked about, there are five um, areas that we're going to that we focused on when it came to cost optimization and efficiencies. Um, I'm going to go into each of those uh, specifically, and you'll see some of the conversations being tied to uh, each of those uh, topic areas. So let's hit the build a modern workforce. Today, and I've been in this market for the last 21 years now um, in the consulting space, in the market, in the workforce. We all recognize, and I'm sure a lot of people over the last two years have realized, is the workforce over the last two years has changed. The expectations have changed. Pandemic, when I think March 12th, I think almost two years ago today, brought us to an understanding that the typical workforce going into work um, nine to five has changed. Jeff talked about some tools that have enabled, you know, teleworking. And thanks to all that, we were able to keep the operations going. All of us, public sector, private sector, any organization today was able to keep all those things going. What has transitioned is how this workforce continues beyond the pandemic. We all know today, a lot of things are opening up. A lot of states are uh, reducing the guidelines uh, around uh, the masks and around presence and not being in at the work offices and all that. However, the talent pool today is has has demonstrated, has definitely uh, proved that 
they can telework, they can, there can be opportunities for having a work-life balance and they're choosing those. Like, like every organization today on the call, uh, the States and even as KBMG, we are out there looking for opportunities, looking for ways, uh, innovative ways to or reorganize the workforce because that's the market, that's the mar- workforce that everybody is looking for. So how are we gonna allow teleworking how are we going to allow hybrid, uh, you know, workforce? And what type of uh, individuals are going to be like in office? Every organization is creating these buckets, or I'm sure there are more uh, buckets that are being created. But these are the three groups that we are seeing primarily around certain folks who are going to permanently telework, certain folks who are going to be permanently in the office uh, like it used to be, and some folks who are going to be in this hybrid model. And the key is tied to the second topic on the screen. How do you develop the brand and the culture for this talent? And this is getting more and more critical. Over the last two years, and we, before I get into that, there has been a term that has been indicated as the great resignation. It's not about attrition. It's not about hiring. It's all about retention. And that's where I kind of hit the employer of choice or the culture aspects of developing the brand. Every organization today, especially on the public sector side, it is becoming more and more important to establish a culture that, that defines who your organization is or what your organization stands for. It's no longer, I get a payroll, I get my benefits, I move on. Today's workforce and the workforce for the next 30 years is going to is looking for if I'm working remotely, how do I get the same or almost similar experience? What is the organization doing to invest in me? What is what are some of the things that I have to do to promote my career growth? It's 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 one of the when um, it's uh, one of the things that we learned when we were talking to one of the states. Uh, one of the participants made a pretty pretty real quote that is applicable to the workforce today. And he said, benefits don't pay my rent. That's the message the workforce is sending today. They want to grow their careers. They want to be compensated differently. They want to work um, in flexible locations. They want to learn new skills. And this is something that we're seeing more and more public sector organizations focus on. Um, how do you focus on labor unions and those, uh, those bargaining arrangements and say, help your workforce to transition into the way of the future? Technology is changing, like Jeff mentioned. Um, things are no longer paper-based. There's a lot more digitization. And even within digitization, there's a lot more cloud and a lot more modern disruptive technologies that are changing the way people do business. It's more analytical work that's happening. So how do you enable your workforce into all these things? Bring it all together and build a culture that makes your folks retain. Going back to, it's not about the attrition. The great resignation is about uh, people resigning and looking for a new job. But more importantly, um, every organization today, we feel and we're seeing that more and more in the market is how do we create a culture that allows for employers to retain people? That's the biggest challenge today. And that is directly tied to what's my culture to help them stay, grow beyond the pay, beyond the benefits, give them the work-life balance, give them the stability in the job, um, give them learning opportunities, um, give them different differentiators, if I can call them, that will make them stay and get, build their career with their organization. And the most important thing, or one of the key things in there is tied to learning. Um, a lot of states, and we're gonna to talk to Casey today, but a lot of states are investing in learning and development. And it's not just, let me invite you to a classroom training. It's on-demand training. A lot of our work has become on-demand. Uh, whether it be uh, food through the delivery services, any kind of you know uh, television, everything has become on demand. And employees are looking for, how can I make my learning more on demand? Um, and 
more career progressive. It's not, hey, this is the system that I have. This is the system I'm going to use to do my work. And this is the knowledge I'm going to build. It's, I want to learn how to do project management. I want to learn how to do business analysis. I want to learn about cybersecurity. We're going to talk about it at the later part of the presentation. These are the skills that as an employee, people want to be aware, people want to get trained, people want to get into outcomes and build their careers and make those choices by themselves. And that's what building a modern workforce is all about. And that's what we've learned around it. Uh, Pam, I know there is uh, an amazing um, story from Missouri in um, KCW that you guys are gonna talk about. So um, Pam, over to you. Thanks, Josh. It was a great foundation as we're going to jump into the work that's happening in Missouri, and I'm thrilled to have Casey on the call with us today. Um, Casey, I know there's been a lot of changes in the state, um, both in your priorities, your leadership, and then we dump this global health pandemic on top of everything else that you all have been working on. You're continuing to focus on your, your teams, your employees, your staff becoming and being that employer of choice. Can you share a little bit with your colleagues on today's call, um, an overview of your initiatives and maybe some of those benefits that you're seeing in the state? Yeah, definitely. Thanks for having, having me here today. As uh, Pam mentioned, we have been going through a handful of transitions in addition to meeting the needs of our workforce during uh, the last two years during the COVID pandemic. And so just a couple examples before I dive into uh, the main topic that I wanna to talk to, which is learning. I think it's important to recognize that uh, in 2019, the state of Missouri underwent, began a talent management transformation. It was really our recognition that we were not doing nearly enough to meet the needs of our talent our most precious resource, right? We have almost 50,000 state employees who work for the state of Missouri. And we did a pulse survey of those 50,000 and heard from, I believe it was just over 76% of them. So an incredible response rate. And so that was our baseline for what we now call the quarterly pulse survey. And so we engage every, every one of our state team members on a quarterly basis to ask them a handful of different questions to see how we are doing and how we could be doing better. And so a couple, couple big initiatives that kicked off in, the in 2019 or the first part of 2020, again, before COVID uh, really started to affect us, was a rethinking of how we recruited at the state of Missouri. We uh, probably, like many of you, followed a post and pray method. Uh, we just figured we'll put an application uh, request uh, um, uh, job posting out there, and of course the most brilliant people will apply. It didn't matter that we didn't have one way for them to apply. We didn't have a common site. Uh, some people applied via fax, some people uh, phone call. But in 2020, we launched mocareers.mo.gov, our first uh, common application tool. And so that really set, that was the first of many initiatives that we rolled out related to talent. Um, the one that I'm gonna focus on today, and so I think you can click to the next slide. I think maybe, oh, nope, okay. Um, maybe it's part of the package that's gonna come out afterwards to all of you. But what I wanted to focus on today was LinkedIn Learning. And we call this Mo Learning, uh, everything, show me Mo, everything's around Mo in the state of Missouri. And LinkedIn Learning launched in uh, the last part of 2019. Again, we set it up before the pandemic, but it was really during the pandemic when we reaped all the benefits of all the hard work that we got this underway. And so if you are not familiar with LinkedIn Learning, it is a, a part of the LinkedIn family and it offers tens of thousands of courses by best in class experts, whether or not they be professors or thought leaders, um, thousands of courses on demand, so 24 seven opportunity for all of our 50,000 state workers. And so they can, uh, they can learn any topic they want at any time that they want. And we can do this all for less than $5 Either, a person. And so if you talk about efficiency um, and um, cost effectiveness, definitely uh, this, this is a great solution if you're looking for reaching all of your team members. One of the things that we heard from the quarterly pulse survey 
is that there was investment in certain populations, but not in all. And so by enabling everyone with a single sign-on, however they sign on to their computer, uh, the ability to learn any topics. Previously, it was mentioned project management, cybersecurity, um, work-life balance, communications, any topic that, you, that, that is out there, it's a pretty good chance that LinkedIn Learning has it. And so this really enabled us to reach all of our team members wherever they needed it, just in time on demand learning. And so at the height of the pandemic, we had upwards of 43% of the state workforce working remotely. And while that doesn't sound like a lot, you have to keep in mind that we have a lot of direct care team members, whether it be in corrections facilities, mental health facilities, social services. And so those, those people just can't work from home. And so 43% of our population did work from home. And the ability for us to continue investing in our team members, continuing for them to grow and learn via LinkedIn Learning was, was a huge, huge resource for us. During that time, we were also able to get better at things like um, onboarding because we could put our new team members, they couldn't come into the office, but we could introduce them into the ideas that we wanted them to learn about uh, through the online on-demand training through LinkedIn Learning. Um, LinkedIn Learning also enables you to up upload custom content. And so we have put a lot of our training that we used to do in person, we've put a lot of that online to uh, facilitate, facilitate the learning across the state. We've saved a lot of money in terms of um, travel, resources, mileage, things like that, because we can now reach people where they are, wherever they are in the state. Um, a couple other things that I wanted to highlight, we uh, previously, the, um, uh, Yash talked about the culture and culture being something that was really important to uh, talents now. And so because LinkedIn Learning is connected uh, with the greater LinkedIn family, people can share lessons that they've learned and start to have conversations with their colleagues. And even people outside of the state can see and follow those posts to understand that the state of Missouri really does value learning and growth for each of our team members. And uh, try, try to recruit team members just by building the brand. The, um, the, the experience that you could have while you worked at the state of Missouri through the learning platform. Uh, in addition, we try to big, build culture within teams using LinkedIn Learning. And so I know there are many people who are um, kind of opposed to online learning because you don't get that in-person communication uh, teamwork atmosphere. And so what a lot of divisions have done is started things like Mo Learning Monthly. And so, for example, in my division, we have a team member pick a topic I, and everyone watches a LinkedIn learning video for that month, and then we come together on a monthly basis and we have a discussion about it. And so those can be really valuable ways to build smaller cultures and to remind people that even though you might be working remotely, you are not out on a remote, uh, a, a remote island. We're all in this together, and we can have a, a meaningful conversation based on common understanding or common learning that we had just engaged with. So, uh, I think I'll stop there and see if, Pam, you have any questions or any other questions from the audience about uh, our learning experience at the state of Missouri. Thanks, Casey, and you all are doing such excellent work. I hope everyone on the call has a chance to go to your website and check out all the different components. I do want to take you back, though, in um, just some of your first comments about the quarterly pulse survey. Two questions um, that come to mind. One, is that Missouri developed? or do you have an outside vendor who helps you with that? And then two, tell me a little bit about how your team actually analyzes those results. What do you do with it? Oh, great, yeah, love it. Uh, thank you for the question. So the first quarterly pulse survey was our baseline survey and that was developed with a vendor, the common um, set of uh, engagement surveys that they have used with many public and private sector in the past. And then we took the uh, data from that to identify five outcomes that we wanted to focus on. And so our survey now is completely state-led uh, state and state-analyzed. We use a system called Qualtrics, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It's an online survey tool. So we, uh, we do all of the surveying via Qualtrics. Again, people can do it on computer, phone, whatever it is, and it is completely anonymous. Um, we, that's really important to our state team members to realize that we cannot uh, dive down to figure out who said what and why and how. Uh, we keep strong anonymity um, uh, features in place. 
And so once we pull in the information from uh, the survey, we have this two-week window for people to complete the survey on a quarterly basis. And then in-house, we have a team who dives into the data. And for, I believe we just finished our 12th quarterly pulse survey, so we've been consistent. I believe that we put it off um, a couple weeks during, at the height of the pandemic, but we, we're on our quarterly pulse, and we then display all of the data for leaders to see using Tableau. And so we track movement in the certain areas over time. You can slice and dice the data by department, by division, by location is really important for some divisions, and you can look at it over time. And so a couple of key things that we look at, we are always super focused during the process on participation. We want to encourage as many people to give us feedback as possible. And uh, with all the competing challenges, that can be difficult. And so during the survey time, we're really motivated on getting participation levels. And then at the very beginning, or at the very end of that, uh, we're hyper-focused on celebrating the participation levels and showing high-level outcome movement, whether it be up or down, based on the last time that we surveyed those questions. And then more and more, we're getting into connections in the data. So for example, if, if a large percentage of a division says that they, um, that they uh, believe in the fate or, or they're invested in the fate of the organization, what is that indication correlated with any other pieces? And so we can start to tell the story and do some analytics uh, around um, what, what are we really learning from these uh, from these data, as opposed to at the beginning, it was very clear. People said, we don't have enough, uh, we don't have enough training. My supervisor isn't spending enough time with me. You can see very clear stories there, but now as we're doing it more and more, we're starting to make more connections through each of the questions. That is so very, very helpful. And again, such a great explanation. I hope um, maybe you could drop some links in the chat, Casey, for folks to go check out and um, we can learn more and we will be sharing the full case study in the a report that will be coming out here very, very shortly. So Yash, let me turn it back over to you and let's dive into key area number two. Sure, um, thanks. Uh, thanks, Pam. And Casey, this is this is a perfect, I don't know how we did it, but this is a perfect stage for diving into the next topic. Uh, Tammy, if you wanna hit the next slide up because it's all about di digitization. And, and we talk about technology all day long whether it be mobile technology, whether it be technology that we use today. But what is becoming more and more relevant is how are we modernizing it? When we modernize this technology, what are we doing with our existing processes? How are we enabling that technology to help our workforce? And more importantly, this is where some of the things or two more things. Um, how are we scaling this automation process? And the last but not the least on the topic on that area is uh, how are we exploring the no code, low code development options? Let's go to the first one, modernizing and transitioning application to the cloud. Like, and this may be geek technology, geek terms if you're not, uh, if you don't have the background on technology, but one of the things that has transition or that is transitioning the technology world over the last almost it's been a decade now, I guess, is transforming to the cloud. How a lot of our back offices, whether it be finance functions, HR functions, payroll functions, the LinkedIn learning that we learned about, everything is becoming more and more into the cloud. That is organizations are looking at cloud as a big picture and saying, can I, one, reduce my, you know, data center footprint or my current technology footprint and leverage certain service-based, um, user-based, um, browser-based technologies that are housed in the cloud and modernize my, my workforce and my technology accordingly. And a lot of things are tied to this modernization. Um, even the governments are funding a lot of these um, these initiatives, um, and there are some organizations in some states and local jurisdictions um, looking at uh, leveraging the ARPA funds, the American Rescue Plan Act funds, to see how that applies for these technology upgrades. Um, traditionally, I've been in this government business for more than two decades now, and what we've noticed is 
there is there are a lot of I guess uh, parameters tied to transitioning to the cloud. Um, it starts with the co contract requirements, and one of the things that we want the states to start thinking about is: Does our contract requirements align to the leading technology practices that that is out there, from a technology usage perspective, from an IP perspective, from a data perspective, from a pricing model perspective? All these things form a part of one of the basic parameters that the states and local jurisdictions need to start focusing on to start off modernizing their technology. And while they're modernizing the vision, which is really important, what is my future state operating model gonna look like? It's not about what is my technology looking like. It's how am I gonna operate as an organization to leverage this technology to the fullest? Um, growing up in the technology space, I knew when I would walk into an organization to you know, modernize a technology, it would be, oh, these are my requirements. These are my individual fields that I need on the screen. Technology today has transformed. It's become a lot more flexible. It's not somebody writing 2 million lines of code to do exactly what you want today. And this is where the investment matters from state's perspective, from local jurisdiction's perspective. How do you enable the technology? And today's technology is, is a lot flexible and can do a lot more without code. But the more important piece that I want to modernize, focus on from a modernization standpoint is, are you transitioning your operations? You're changing your business processes, transforming the business processes to leverage the highest use of technology and how that application is created. It helps you in the long run from a maintainability standpoint. And from a scale and automation, which is our second topic, it helps you create a journey, create an automation journey, an opportunity to move into that space. And that's what it's all about. Um, and the, it also ties to the third one, actually, uh, now that I think a little bit more. How are you as an organization leveraging these no code, low code, development platforms or technologies or tools or solutions to automate your basic processes, um, develop scalable business applications that can scale to different levels at different locations, especially with the pandemic, people operating from different places. This has become more and more important. It's not the same old school green screen system that I can deploy and I'll have to do a lot more infrastructure changes to my thing. Um, I wanna actually, since we're talking technology and we have a great participant in, uh, in this, and Gary and I have talked at length on this, but Gary, do you want to share some of your um, journey, um, uh, I guess, uh, activities throughout the, uh, for the state of California and sure. share some of the things that you've done for the state? Sure. Hello, everyone. Um, again, my name is Gary Renslow, I'm with the Department of General Services in California and the IT shop CIO. Um, yes, I, this is a very relevant topic in our hybrid work environment. So on modernizing uh, and moving to the cloud, we've looked at a lot of different options. We have about 40% of all our operations in the cloud now with an initiative to be a fully cloud-based operation within the next two to three years. Um, that means a work from anywhere to anywhere environment. Um, no longer having a local data center or on-site hardware other than networking at the appropriate buildings. Um, that means looking at technology from many perspectives of people, place, um, and process. And um, going forward with that, uh, there is an avenue for custom development that uh, works in the environment of modulization um, where it's reusable code. Um, there's techniques of hybrid agile um, where appropriate. In other cases, we're looking at our applications inventory with the many different business lines. We have about 130 different applications what can be used uh, or transferred or migrated to a low code, no code uh, type of platform. There are incredible advantages, the technology's ready. And what, what advantages are those that we look at? Uh, those solutions are mobile device ready. 
There's no particular programming to make um, your services available at mobile device levels, which enhances the customer experience who's always on the go. The development is much faster. Um, I have a small team, for example, of, of 11 people that work in this area. Um, they run about 20 to 25 enhancements per, per month while they're working on about 10 different projects. Uh, it's a continuous development environment. It's focused on the product, not the project. Um, it, we're able to be very responsive to business. If they have a new need, we can produce results for them in a matter of months um, or even faster. Uh, these platforms are always current. They're nearly evergreen. Um, if you're uh, used to working in teams, as you know, they push out updates and you just see them when they happen. Yep. Um, there's no massive technology upgrades needed. You do not have technical debt any longer. You don't have to have projects for that. Um, every quarter we upgrade uh, all our applications in that environment. It's always current. The infrastructure and related security controls are all built into the platform. You have a platform, there are platforms that are ready to go. You can take that out of your development cycle now because it's already ready. Uh, these products typically uh, work really well with integrated or what's called fusion teams with the business. And you, you are working, your developers and the business side are working together and the business side is actually getting the experience and lean process development um, and actually becoming a part of, in a way, the IT team. Um, so those are just some examples of, of what we've seen as the great benefits of this technology. And this is great. And it kind of, and we'll, Gary, I'm going to, um, I think Pam's going to ask you one more question, I think, from what I understand. But before we go there, there's one thing I wanted to make sure uh, we highlight, which is tied directly to the next slide. Um, Tammy, if you, thank you. Um, it's around, would you mention the word responsiveness to the business? And what we've noticed is it's becoming more and more critical. Regulations are changing. Business needs are changing. Workforce we talked about at length that is changing. Their needs are changing. Um, data is becoming more and more accessible. So the data volume is changing. And all it boils down to is how do we streamline our shared services model to deliver to all these different stakeholders, if I could call them, and all these different needs and um, departments. And what we are seeing more and more is a lot of states are going away from, hey, every department will have a small IT team or every department will have a small business analyst team. There are, there are specific needs for certain areas, but we are seeing more and more of a shared services model where a centralized way of delivering services, a centralized way of delivering IT, the centralized, we heard about LinkedIn learning a little. That's a centralized way of training and development and talent management. And that's all bringing it all together. That's the topic. The first topic from an efficiency model perspective is around shared services and how we deliver value that directly contribute to the new ways of, work, of working. And then the second topic on that is how do we purchase these services, products, solutions, um, processes, resources? And I think that's where one of the big areas, especially in the public sector space, having I mean, we work on the other side of the fence, is a lot of governments working towards streamlining some of those processes so that way the purchasing is a lot more effective. It supports the need and in a timely manner the resources and of course with all the legal boundaries and everything in place and which is necessary but these are some of the uh, aspects we are seeing and more importantly it's a tangent but i want to tie it all together it's also tied to one of the buzzwords but it's it's still very relevant i shouldn't be calling it a buzzword is esg environmental social governance which is how am I supporting with my purchasing, with my contracting, the environmental side of things? How am I supporting the social side? And how am I making sure my governance goals around supplier diversity and even my environmental and social goals around supplier diversity, green procurement policies, all that is brought together into how I go and purchase, which is more becoming more and more important for the chief administrator's job. 
So Pam, I don't know if you want to use that as a segue to <laughs> build on to your question. Thanks, Josh. Well, there's so many different things that we could talk about with California and with Gary. Um, but I do want to zero in just quickly on one component that we did hear as part of the site collaborative and part of our discussions. Um, Gary, you all took some, some pretty big undertakings in a pretty short of time when we're looking at state government and state policy, and you made a pretty significant switch in um, your signatures going to an e-signature process. You want to share a little bit about that and some of the benefits that you've seen in the state? Sure, sure, thank you. Um, we own the forms program for the state of California. There's about 4,000 forms uh, that are used between departments and with the public. And one of the largest hurdles in the digital transformation and moving from forms to workflow was e-signature. Um, many offices did not know exactly which e-signature was applicable, how to use that, um, and how to implement it. And then there was a culture adoption. So we decided to address that to make sure that we could get beyond that and get to the next step, which I can talk about in a little bit as well. Um, but we worked with legal staff, procurement staff, um, with other agencies uh, about their, their e-signature um, concerns or issues. And we ended up developing a e-signatures toolkit to help them understand and use our um, efforts as a model. So for instance, we developed an internal policy. We made that available for other departments. There was a lot of question about what tools are available. How do I use them? So we developed tutorials um, and guidelines with typical examples of signing a uh, personnel document or a contract and kind of categorize those into legal documents and internal documents and how they might use them. Um, so a lot of time was spent on that. Uh, with also with our legal office, with our state controller's office, just to get over that initial adoption. We did implement that back in 2019 for our contracts process. And uh, all, all of this information actually is available in a case study on our website. Um, we can make that available to everybody as, as to how we did that. Um, but we quickly realized time savings internally um, with our staff, and this was even before the hybrid work model was really fully in place, um, but they had a transparency now of a process. They could see the workflow um, of the contract form now that it was digitally enabled with an e-signature. They knew the status of it. Um, our vendors quickly uh, received it. There were no more documents in the mail. They could turn it around quickly, um, and we went from uh, weeks to days on the signature process. Um, very interestingly, also once a, the workflow was digitized, we have dashboards available. Um, and I could ask just this morning before this call, how's it going? The procurement chief looked at their dashboard and said, well, it looks like we're averaging 16 hours per contract for an e-signature. Took, it took her two, three minutes. Uh, in the past, that would have been very, very difficult uh, without the electronic flow and the dashboards that uh, electronic workflows enable. So it was a great example of just moving from a form to a workflow. Um, we have many other examples of that as, as we're um, moving forward. Um, now's the time to really address this. The hybrid work uh, force has really accelerated adoption. Um, what, what, what it was for us to adopt better internally was making widely available the tools and the training through our own uh, training office within DGS here. We have about 3,600 staff and they make the training readily available with these examples. The tools are readily available, whether they're Microsoft or Azure and many other uh, vendors, sorry, or Adobe. Um, there's so many out there. And it's interesting to see how it's changed after a couple of years. Customers aren't asking for a form anymore. They're asking for an automated workflow. It's, it's really exciting to see that. 
And um, we, the, so the culture has changed in, in what our own staff expect to use and, and what outwards between other departments and the public expect as well. So e-signature has really accelerated. Um, with that, we're looking to transform the forms program. We, again, have those 4,000 forms available. They're all uh, ADA compliant now, but what is that next step? Um, we issued a policy that asked all departments to implement electronic signatures on forms. We meet with departments, we hold forms uh, webinars uh, to help them with their questions and what tools are available. For instance, what contracts can you buy off of? How quickly can you do that? Um, and what, what use cases best fit with those particular tools. So we're, we're there to help and that, that guidance really starts to expand as we get more and more use cases of forms adoption. Um, our transformation effort, which is new, um, which we plan to put out in policy, have to do with any remaining paper to digital transition. Um, when you look at a form, have you looked at a, a workflow-based automation? Um, are you looking at multi-platform support and data retrieval? What do you do with that information? What is your full, full audit trail? Security, data analytics and reporting, accessibility, cost effectiveness, data integrity. So it's very different than the past. The old guidance was, did you set up the fonts right? Are your boxes right? Are you using a form number correctly? Much different than, than it was in the past. And uh, with this, I think we can really accelerate adoption of workflow across the state. So we'll be reaching out to other departments um, to review their inventories. What are their top use forms? What are the ones that would really impact their business and get timelines down from, from weeks to days? That's what we're um, hoping to accomplish uh, over the next uh, few years and uh, start some pilot cases with, with various departments. Great, Gary. And again, so many different initiatives that you all have undertaken in the past couple of years. If there's a link that you'd like to add to the chat, I would ask that you do that. I'm seeing some great uh, conversation going on there as well. So, Yash, I'm going to turn it back to you to take sure. us through the remainder of our key areas. Absolutely. And um, if you want to hit the next slide, and this is a perfect segue into the topic of enhancing trust. And when I Say enhancing trust, the natural inclination is cybersecurity. However, I want to hit up the topic before, uh, the second topic before. It's evolving performance management. And it's about not only enhancing trust in your technology, it's enhancing trust in your processes and your people. And that's something that Gary and Pam were talking about. How do I help my workforce leverage the technology? And maybe I'm trying to bring it all together. How do I? Leverage the workforce, enhance, leverage the technology, enhance the way of doing things, automate these processes, streamline these processes, and instill trust from a performance standpoint. Do I have the right KPIs, key performance indicators? Does my data, does my technology, does my process provide the right output that is needed in a timely manner when I'm rushing things or when I'm delivering certain things from a uh, particular aspect. And that's where the, about, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, I guess, direction in ev evolution of performance management across the different workforce. It's no longer, I can do my job from nine to five. It's about what am I doing different? How am I doing more complex value added efforts that will, of course, with all the security and all the data and the trust. But how am I doing more complex value add activities and supporting the organization versus I have to enter 200 items in a form today? I think that's where the technology is going. That's where the workforce is going. And that's what I wanted to tie this together to enhancing that trust. Uh, one of the famous quotes that we heard during when we were doing this collaborative is, you have to inspect what you expect. And it's, it's, it's so true when you think about from a market standpoint is how do you re-examine those KPIs that if I'm expecting something from you as a KPI, I know exactly what to inspect and how to inspect that. 
And that ties to the first earlier topic, which is the cybersecurity um, on this enhancing of trust. With the situation today globally, um, cybersecurity has become an extremely important and critical element of your solutions, of your people, of your processes. It's not just about, is my technology secure? Yes, that is important. But are there processes, procedures around managing the organization, managing the uh, security of the individuals, managing the um, cybersecurity processes around what am I sharing from a data standpoint? Are there some vulnerabilities that I need to be careful about? Back in the day, when we used to implement different tools, technologies, it used to be, there used to be a security lead and a couple of people who would show up doing testing, doing some code development and say, here's what I want from a security. And it, it wasn't, there wasn't a lot of investment from organizations and states to invest in cybersecurity. With the, with the cybersecurity threats that are happening, there is more and more emphasis on how do we make our solutions more secure? And it starts at the very beginning. When you have a vision of an, of an application, when you have a vision for what are you gonna do with your technology or your solution, involve a focused cybersecurity leadership and a set of individuals and stakeholders that will be there throughout the journey to mitigate your risks, to mitigate your issues, to design your solutions in such a way, and also enable that third-party vendor relationship from a security standpoint. So that way, when you go out and test and you code and configure and deploy that solution, you have gone through the whole planning, design, or configuration aspects of cybersecurity from a cybersecurity standpoint, not just from, from a business operation standpoint. And the other aspect of the cybersecurity that I want to highlight is how are, what's the mindset in terms of having your business continuity plan, or you can call it these days a cyber resiliency plan. A lot of times back in the day, business continuity plan was, if my solution is down, what am I going to do? These days, it's more important to invest in that cyber resiliency plan because it's no longer I can stand up my a backup server or a backup data center. It is more about if you are going through a cyber attack, your entire platform's down. What is your cyber resiliency plan? Do I have the right operations, communications, change management, training, tools or backup tools that I can use to continue my operations? Because today's operations is a lot different from one that you had 10 years ago. So that's the enhancing of trust. Um, and the last topic in our, um, um, in our collaborative piece was around, uh, Tammy, if you wanna hit the next one. Is around extracting greater value from the assets. And I will do what I know um, State of Arizona couldn't be with us today as a part of this uh, webcast, but or recognize today, uh, I recognize Arizona on some of the things that they've done um, in, in this space. When I say recognizing greater value from your current assets is every chief administrator's office today is responsible for a lot of types of assets. It could be buildings, fleet, you know, um, office spaces, workspaces, garages, you name it and vehicles from you know, fleet perspective. Pandemic taught us that you wanna use your workspace in the most flexible way. You wanna use your assets in the most flexible way. And in this optimization world, this was one of the factors that a lot of states, especially Arizona as an example, because we had some lengthy conversations with them around how they leverage the hybrid workforce, the technology to reduce their footprint footprint on real estate, fleet, because it saves uh, money on leases. It saves money on uh, fleet vehicles, which it also includes maintenance, operations around it, uh, asset depreciation, all those factors that tie it all together. And more importantly, it is with the hybrid workforce or the teleworking workforce, it reduced the carbon footprint, helped with the ESG focus areas for the state. And it also, from a 
benefit perspective, it also added from an employee work-life balance perspective, it helped um, retain a lot of employees. So from a savings perspective, there are tangible, like I think there was two or $3 billion of savings over the course of the certain years that Arizona was able to realize. And also the utilization of employees, offering them some alternative office models. Um, one of the other organizations that we, uh, states that we talked to, they are exploring um, opportunities where there is a rework kind of a concept where there are some dedicated spaces for uh, specific operations, but there are flexible working spaces for folks to collaborate because everybody still wants to collaborate and focus and build their skills, build their careers, but deliver the operations that are needed. But it's more important to also provide that flexibility. And that's what we're seeing a lot of organizations, public and private sector, start doing those from that perspective. So enhancing your real estate portfolio, identifying some green workspaces, um, and also technology. We talked about cloud and all those other things. Today, a lot of things, a lot of these technologies are tied to how much carbon footprint can I reduce leveraging certain new technologies? And it ties to not only the tech, it also ties to your office spaces. People want, uh, the generation today wants to go to a green workspace. They want to reduce commute. They're going to electric vehicles. So how is my parking lot structured to support that electric vehicle? Is my building smart enough from a technology standpoint? All these collectively will are, is helping states today defining a plan to reduce their cost from a real estate standpoint, reduce their carbon footprint and reduce uh, and increase the uh, workforce um, um, optimization from that perspective. So that's uh, what I wanted to um, try to bring it all together, how all these five areas, the five different areas, are all tied together in from a state and local government standpoint, and even from a private sector standpoint, to helping streamline and support cost optimizations and efficiencies for organizations. Pam? Great, gosh, thank you so much. And what a great conversation today. And again, this is just a sneak peek at um, the full report that will be coming out shortly. But before we close, we've got just a couple of minutes. Um, I wanna open it back to all of our speakers today to see if there's one key takeaway. Um, uh, this whole conversation has been around creating efficiency. Ultimately, what we're looking for is um, economic success and also benefits to our customers and our constituents. But maybe one key takeaway that each of our speakers today could share with so Yash, I'm gonna put you on the spot first and then we'll just go around the horn. All right, that's a curveball. But um, I think I tied it together. I tried to tie it together at the end. Doing, becoming more efficient from a takeaway standpoint, how do we do more with less and make it more efficient is in a different way. It's not just doing more work and not getting paid more, but it's how you bring it all together and still deliver the right value for the customer. Great, thank you. Jeff? I think the word is nimble. I think we oh, learned oh. to be more nimble the last almost two years. And I think, you know, we're all learning that being nimble, being a little more uh, accepting of things are just gonna be different and uh, being able to and being enabled to change on the fly as we need to. So I think styles are gonna have to change a little or have already changed and just need to keep being refined. So that's my take. Thank you. Uh, Gary, then we'll wrap up with Casey. I would say the time is right and the technology is ready. Um, work with your business partners to embrace it, uh, provide the training and tools. Uh, the procurement vehicles are there. Uh, so I see moving to workflow and government services as a, as a major improvement of our services for efficiency, uh, green, uh, and actually savings. Casey? And I would say that uh, we need to meet our team members where they are with whatever type of training they're needing in that moment. And so that's why something like LinkedIn Learning with 24 seven access to thousands of different courses is a great idea. They didn't even pay me to say that. 
<laughs> we'll make sure you know they got the plug. <laughs> thank you all so, so much. Again, thank you for joining us today. Um, links in the chat to what's happening in the states. We'll be glad to share what's happening is in Arizona as well. All three of the states will be highlighted in the final report, which will be out here very, very soon. Thanks to everybody, Yash, Jeff, Casey, Gary, really appreciate you all and your thought leadership today. And again, to everyone who's on the call, appreciate you being with us. Um, you can see this content on demand in our Knowledge Center, and we will see you in the next couple of weeks for our next national webinar. We'll talk Thank to you Thank you, Pam. Soon. Thank Bye, you, everybody. Pam and Nasca. This was great. Thank you for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Casey, thanks. And Gary, good to see you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.